just remind members about their mobile phones and Blackberries that they will interfere with recording equipment, so please switch them off. Um, I've had no apologies. Anybody else? Okay, um, just under chairperson's business, um, I'm just reminding members again in terms of their, their tablets here uh, periodically over the recess. It's probably useful, and I would expect MLAs to be active anyway, to uh, ensure that the tablets are updated so that we don't then experience any delays and downloads after the recess. I uh, want to advise members, obviously, that on Monday the deputy chairperson and myself met with the panel of experts who are carrying out the review of children's heart surgery uh, on an all-Ireland basis. Uh, they're carrying out a series of meetings in Belfast and Dublin this week, and they're due to report to both ministers by the 1st of July. So it's a fairly tight time frame, so that's for, for members' information. Uh, yes, Kieran. Uh, Chair, for that, uh, just when you raise it, um, it has been brought to my attention that there was um, a young baby was scheduled for to have an operation last week. And everything was in place, set up. The mother got a, a phone call to say that on the Saturday that it was put off because of, I think, what you're, you're only after explaining. And I don't know that that's good enough whenever a family is set up for a, an operation to be cancelled because of some uh, conference. And I, I, I don't know why we should maybe raise that with the minister. It, it was brought to my attention as well, and I have referred it on to the Permanent Secretary and the Trust, because it's ultimately not a, an issue for the, the panel of experts that we were meeting, but it's certainly uh, an issue for, for the, the Trust to give an explanation. And I understand that there, there has been some contact made there, so it's ongoing. Um, so that was yes. the same? The same, yes. The same. yes. All right, right. I but I mean, you can understand the frustration of parents when, when the youngsters scheduled for an operation, all the planning going in and set up, and get a phone call on Saturday to say it's not on. Because of this, so that was because the consultant hadn't a chance to meet the parents and explain the procedure. Now, uh, that may not have been related at all to the visit by the the, the expert group, but it, it is being dealt with. Yeah, and I think we just need to be mindful as well. It's a, it's, a, it's an individual case, and, and respect that. Uh, I want to advise members that AGNI launching the report, the denial of NHS continuing healthcare. That's on the 28th of May. Uh, in Parliament buildings. Would members be content to sponsor the event? Great. Okay, thank you. Uh, I want to refer members as well to the written statement the Minister made about the Northern Trust on Friday the 28th of March at page 5 of, of your pack. Uh, also advising members that the Minister had made an oral statement yesterday dealing with unscheduled care and the serious adverse incident system. The RQIA uh, expert-led report is due to uh, report to the Minister in mid-June, uh, and the committee will schedule a briefing on the report at that time. Uh, I'm going to ask members if they have any comments at this stage. Yes, Fair I am conscious that uh, you know, obviously get, this is all happening against the backdrop of, of uh, extreme pressures in the system, uh, which are presenting themselves around accident and emergency. Um, uh, as we all know, the ambition of TYC is about taking from here to there. Um, we now see, the, uh, and we are not convinced, at least a lot of people I talk to are not convinced that that is happening appropriately, fast enough or well enough or strategically enough. Uh, we're seeing things like uh, the announcement yesterday, which is linked but separate around the governance. Uh, we're seeing things like today's uh, emergency uh, department uh, conference, which may extend or may not extend uh, wider than the issues of A and D, but we don't know, and we don't know the status of that, uh, uh, whether it's informing the board or it's just a listening exercise or whatever. Uh, but this committee has a role to scrutinise scrutinise health policy and those who administer it. And I would like the committee to discuss and reflect on uh, whether or not we're seeing sufficient measurables around the strategic plan, which is TYC, uh, and its direction and the implementation of it. I don't see them. I know an awful lot of people, including the people that we talked to last week at our stakeholder event, and I've talked to a lot of unions uh, and uh, other people at the co-face in the health service who do an excellent job against enormous stress, 
uh, and I think the committee should consider either conducting its own review or urging the minister uh, to conduct an independent or have conducted an independent review of the implementation of transforming your care with a view to restoring some kind of public confidence in terms of what's happening with our health service because that public confidence uh, is hugely undermined at the moment uh, and that's uh, uh, linked uh, it's not just in the public mind it's about poor patient outcomes and about huge stresses in the system and uh, if we don't do anything to reflect on that at this stage, then I think we're not doing our job. Okay, any comments on that? I mean, I, I, Chair, I would certainly support what has been said. Um, I mean, I've used the term uh, pause, perhaps, in, in, in relation to transforming your care. And at you know, different meetings that I've been at, the people are really at their tether's end, and we get statements after statements, uh, well intentioned, undoubtedly, in the assembly. Now, there's a was it a conference or a summit today? Um, I don't know what the outcome of that will be, but if it brings us any, forward, any further forward in convincing our constituents that transforming your care, even if, if, if it has to be painful at this uh, moment in time, that there's going to be a result. But that is not, we cannot see that at this moment in time. And I would support if Fergal is, is suggesting that we, we maybe, this committee maybe has it, an inquiry or whatever about where we are and before it's too late. Okay. Any other comments? Folks, the, the reason that precipitate transforming your care is the view by experts that if we don't radically change how we deliver health and social care in Northern Ireland, that in 2020 we, we just simply can't deliver it at all, uh, except that it's come in a period of really quite worrying financial changes, the whole welfare reform issue, and if we don't go down that road, what's going to happen? And, uh, proposed new CSR and predictions and financing and that sort of thing, but you know I don't think what whilst I think we can ask for an update from the <coughs> department. Uh, I wouldn't think like to think that the committee is going to go back in its position of actually supporting transforming your care, which we did. Because, because. With respect, Chair, that's not what I'm I'm saying. I mean I think we're all agreed that we support the general and yeah. broad ambitions of transforming your care against the backdrop of recognising exactly the stresses that are going to come in the future against and also against the uh, continuing financial pressures. But in any strategic plan, you've got to measure what it is you're doing. And we're not seeing any or substantial evidence being presented to us about the measurements. There are 99 targets in TYC. Are we aware of what they all are in terms of where they are now halfway through the process? Mm -hmm. We can't say we are. And there is a reasonable suspicion, if not a major suspicion, that TYC is causing some of these stresses. And yet we see today the Minister and others looking at just the symptom side of it, where the pressures are emerging. Now, if we don't, as I say, if, if, if there's any truth to that, and the, it's not this isn't coming from me, this is coming from those who are at the cold face of the, of the health service and unions and others, that they suspect the very TYC agenda or its implementation, so just to be clear, its implementation is causing those stresses. And it would be uh, remiss of us not to ask for some measurement of that at this point in time to assure ourselves that it's either going in the right direction or it's not. This is a four billion pounds a year business. And we're looking to shift substantial monies from one side of it to another. And in the stakeholder events we heard last week, we're hearing that a lot of those community groups that are at the forefront of this are, are not getting their funding or having their funding, funding cut uh, or are not are being ignored in the work that they do. And that's just small tier, if you like, uh, community involvement. Uh, we need, and we heard last week, that there's only, there's only one pilot so far in the Belfast Trust in relation to acute home care for the elderly. So, you know, where strategically is all of this? And I think that's the big question to ask, and I think we need to get answers to it. I think perhaps what we do is need is an update. The committee needs an update on transforming your care, how it is progress, and how it's meeting its targets. We are fully uh, aware of the concerns of, of many, including obviously staff. We've spoken to staff and 
certainly during her recent visit to the Royal. And uh, I think we need to keep it in perspective, what is happening. But yeah, an update from, perhaps from the department is, is coming under new leadership. The whole drive of transforming your care with um, a change in, uh, at the top. So perhaps we need to get an update on where we actually are with it all. But uh, certainly a number of us that have been here for some time, at this, whenever we get engaged in transforming your care, raise those issues about staffing levels, <coughs> outcomes and about all our various concerns within the health service. And we were perhaps promised, this may be too strong a word, but we certainly were assured that through transforming your care and the change that was going to be brought about, that we would see change within it in the service and as a result of change you would see a more efficient and effective service. So I think we need to perhaps first of all get an update on where we are with it all. What I would say is I think we need to also remember that the health care professionals out there are doing an excellent job in relation to the care of you know, people and our constituents. And I must say, as a local representative, we get complaints from people, mainly about uh, waiting lists. We get complaints. We've had complaints about the ambulance service. We've had complaints about delays. We've had the odd complaint about the standard of care. That, we get, that patients receive. But in the vast majority of cases, the public out there are very satisfied with the standard of care they get within the health service. I think that's important that we put that on the record, because when you put it into proportion, the, there are tens of thousands of people dealt with, even in the A&Es throughout this province, and the majority of them are well treated. They get professional care. They get the care that's, that is required, and they appreciate it. But I've, unfortunately, the media seem to have a frenzy about certain uh, levels of care in certain, uh, certain places like the Belfast Trust. And the media are focusing on that day in and day out. And I think it's time we had a positive message about what's happening with professional staff who are fully committed to what they're doing. They're doing a good job, but perhaps the management needs to sort out what is, what is really happening within the Belfast Trust. The, the problem lies with the management structure within it. It needs to take a grip of what's going on. But I think we need to be careful here. We need to recognise that there's a lot of good work is, is happening. And I believe the vast majority of people out there appreciate what the health service is doing for them. But they are concerned about a number of issues that need to be addressed. And I believe the minister is doing that. And is taking various measures. And we need to be supportive of it. Right. <coughs> I, I agree that we should be um, reviewing the implementation of Transforming Your Care. Um, I'm minded in a number of issues in particular. Um, the overall stress there is in the health service, um, we think ourselves back to the uh, last monitoring round where there was the bid, which was not met at all. Um, is, is the pre I'm just posing the question, is, is the pressure from the health service actually mean there isn't that flexibility to, to move money from A to B? So is, is there, there that flexibility built into the system to allow the change to occur without stress being developed and I, I have concerns there. Could, should we first, I like the idea of looking at the 99 uh, recommendations if that's what they're, they're, the, the number that was there. You know, there's something there to, 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 to um, uh, go down and assess and just refresh ourselves uh, about them all. Um, could we perhaps even kick off by asking the department to provide uh, an update on each of the recommendations and uh, on their implementation? and then see where it goes from there. Um, I think we can't just ignore this issue because unless there is the resources into alternative services, you will end up getting piecemeal alternative with crisis in, in what's currently being provided, and that's the sense that I'm getting at present. And it's even down to very practical things that we have. Somebody told me there recently, we have 20% less health visitors today than there were, I think it was two years ago. Um, there's actually less money in GP practices uh, over this last uh, two years budget. So there, there, there are sort of other figures out there that give me a degree of concern. I thought the money was meant to be going towards primary care and treating people in the community. And I, I just don't know if that's the case or not. Okay, well, I attended the, the summit today and I think the sense in the room was that the vision of TYC is, 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 is the right vision. Um, but the strategic implementation of it and the lack of 
outcomes um, is where, where the flaws currently are. Um, and I have no difficulty whatsoever, and, and, and the, the committee do need to actively use our scrutiny role in, in whatever measure that we can do. I think probably the first step would be that request directly back to the minister to ask for, because I think it's a wee bit more than an update. I think we need to be saying, well, where's the outcome framework for TYC, and you know, how how will the department and minister now restore public confidence? You know, and 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 that, I think that would bring in the 99 recommendations, so that we can start to tease that out. I'm just conscious of the committee's role in this, and obviously where best we can fit in. We are currently reviewing TYC, so I think we'll probably need to take a bit of advice about um, are we, because ultimately we will be reviewing the implementation of something that hasn't been implemented. So I'm quite conscious of just getting the right fit for us. But we're two years down the line. Well, we're yeah. more than two years down the line, Chair, in a five-year process. Uh, at least that's what the headlines were. And I do take on board Gordon's point about getting an update, but at the same time I'd be conscious that we just don't get a message from the department mm, mm. that they want us to hear. So I, I quite like the idea of a measure. I think if we can go back from this discussion, uh, right back to the minister, ask him directly, where is the outcome framework for TYC and an update on, on those recommendations that were made and ask the question, pose the question about how public confidence can, can be built, I suppose, in relation to this process going forward. And that will allow us then, and maybe the, the, the clerk of the committee and the staff can look at potentially where a, a review would fit or how we could fit it. Are people comfortable with that? Yes, and I understand that there is some work being done around public confidence uh, and it will be interesting to see the results of that uh, towards the end of the month. Okay, people um, comfortable? Chair, I don't mean just to clarify because we are going into the Easter recess. Um, they certainly can write to the department and request a paper on those issues. Is that something, uh, um, would the committee then want to start off by, by having an evidence session with departmental board officials? Well, I suppose um, we would, would, it would depend on the response okay. that we would get, so we right. would need to see the response, first of all, I think. Yeah. Okay, is that clear? That okay, members? Thank you for that. Can you Jim? That that consent to us over the Easter recess rather than waiting for the next, if ever a response comes back? Chair, um, I would imagine it would be unlikely because the normal time scale is a 10 working days response from the department, so Really, the ten working days will be the Easter recess, or the in fact, when it arrives. It arrives then, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, members, for that. Okay. Item three, members, is the draft minutes of the meeting on the twenty sixth of March, uh, which is at page twelve. So, asking our members content with the minutes. Okay. Thank you. Item four then is a review of waiting times, the evidence session. We're just waiting on our guest. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. We have Mr. Pedro Gomez. You are very, very welcome. Um, you're the national coordinator of the central unit of the integrated management system of the waiting list for surgery at the Portuguese government. So you're very welcome. And the procedure here is that we would ask you to give a 10-minute presentation, uh, and then we'll open it up for, for questions and answers. So I'll hand Thank over you. to yourself. I must read because my English is not fluent enough to improvise. So if you Excuse me. Thank you for the invitation. I help to transmit what we are doing in Portugal regarding access to surgery. Portugal is a country in southern Europe with 10 million people and a GDP per capita of 15,000 euros. Regarding health resources, we have 417 doctors, 622 nurses per 100,000 inhabitants. 235 hospital beds per 100,000 inhabitants in 109 
hospitals and 1,400 primary care units. National Health Service performs per year and per thousand inhabitants 3,800 consultation admissions, 88 admission in hospital admissions, and 50 surgeries. The total state expenditure on health as a percentage of GDP is 6.3. Infant mortality rate is 3.4 per thousand live births, and life expectancy as birth is 80, per 80 years. Since 1998, SOSIF governments have tried to find solutions to a problem of access to surgical services, experiencing various measures that have failed to re reverse the problem. The problem of access, which manifested itself particularly through excessive delay of for surgery, found its roots in a culture of poorly oriented services for patients. Professionals worked in a rigid organizational architecture to ensure survival of the institution in a logic of preserving cooperative interests and pursuing <coughs> concepts that did not encourage conducts that intended efficiency. Another problem is uh, equitable access. Also, demographic change and technology change and acculturation of society that becomes more demanding and aware of their rights reinforces the need for intervention. We also verified the absence of updated and credible information that supported decision making for all stakeholders. CIGIC is a program created in 2004 by the Minister of Healthcare to fight against waiting lists for surgery. By then, the median waiting time was nearly nine months for more than 200,000 patients. Nowadays, it's three months for one and a half thousand patients. CIGIC is coordinated in national terms by central unit. It's supported by five regional units and by hospital units based in care providers, public and private ones. The activity of surgical services is not limited to performing surgical procedures. It involves every phase of screening, investigating procedures, analysis, complementary medical treatments, pre and post surgery. The activity of these services cannot be evaluated without taking into account that they are integrated network of care that includes primary care, hospital, and continuous care. CIGIC represents in 2013 more than 500,000 surgeries, 5 million appointments, and a business volume of 1.5 billion euros. CIGIC has a matrix of management approach. It integrates needs expressed by patients, pathology, and the various elements of the value change in surgical services. CIGIC observes the distribution of demands, the process compliance, public disclose results, promotes competition and negotiation, improve efficiency and effectiveness of the entire system so it's contributing to his sustainability. CIGIC business model is sustained by an information model named CIGLIC, a financial funding model, a regulating model, and a business process model to manage the waiting list for surgery. The main goal of CIGIC is to focus the services provided by hospitals to meet patients' needs by reducing the waiting time for surgery, guarantee equity in access to surgical treatments, promote efficiency and effectiveness in health services, quality and transparency in management and information, responsibility of players involved in the process. An additional goal is to guarantee that the system is sustainable according to the actual budget constraints that Portugal faces nowadays. The patient waiting time for treatment cannot be measured by taking only into account the waiting time between inscriptions and surgery. Monitoring access is to know the partial waiting times in all process which starts with detections of health problem and finishes with the treatment provided with measurement of gain in health for the patient. The next step for CIGIC will be measuring the referral to treatment times. CIGLIC addresses in an innovative way the information for clinical governments focusing on core business of health. The approach 
to a disease or a set of diseases is made with the establishment of care plan that projects the necessary events to treat the patient. The events occur as many as needed to complete the diagnosis and treatment of the patients. Those set of events are aggregated in one therapeutic episode. CIGLIC has warnings to players involving the management of financial penalties. CIGLIC stakeholders can access information through reports from CIGLIC according to their profile access. Access restrictions are applied to those profiles. All hospital has to transfer normalized data automatically every day to central data center. Data is analyzed, qualified, and reported back to hospitals. Indicators are regular, regularly produced and used for management decisions. CIGIC collects data to provide information to plan, to regulate, and to make the best decisions in political and economic terms by the government. Since the beginning of the program, we observe a positive evolution in all indicators. The number of episodes in waiting lists diminished regardless of the increase in admissions. At the same time, production increased due to a new possibility for medical teams in operating patients after work at the price per patient. An overall result is the dramatic fall of the waiting time, less 59%, the reference of patients to private sector plays a little role, 5 to 7 percent, nevertheless important. Access to surgery, measured by the number of inscriptions per year, has specifically improved. We have seen last year an increase of 42 percent over numbers from 2006 and 3 percent compared to the year before. The extent of inscriptions list for surgery in December 31, 2013, shows a decrease of 20 percent compared to 2006. However, there is an increase compared to 2012 by 5 percent. Notable is the reduction of waiting time, which decreases 59 percent over 2006 and 6.7 percent compared with 2012. Nowadays, the average waiting time is 2.8 months. Surgical activity maintains a sustained growth of 57 uh, since 2006. Between 2012 and 2013, this growth was 1.8 percent, which we consider very satisfactory given the current crisis and given the 8 percent reduction in the budget for surgery. The percentage of patients who exceeded the maximum guaranteed responses, which has improved greatly since 2006, a reduction of 7 percent, still has high values, 12 percent. Nevertheless, it has decreased by 15 percent compared to 2012. Why does CIGIC work? It works because it established penalties for non-compliance with guaranteed maximum response time, reduces, therefore, waiting times. Allowing doctors in hospitals, public hospitals, to do additional surgery promotes productivity. The analysis of expressed demand turns possible optimizations relocating resources. Through the analysis of supply for each provider, it's possible to increase productivity. The monitoring of compliance can correct errors. The collections of standardized data that allows to compare providers as a benchmarking increases efficiency. Identifications of a responsible for each event and the management of information as documents allows accountability. All stakeholders, physicians, patients, managers, share the same information and so control each other. Patient transfers are automatic when exists the risk of exceeding maximum waiting time guaranteed for surgery. In this case, the original public hospital pays the bill. The regular publication of detailed results promotes accountability and allows all stakeholders to control the process. Publication of rates of productivity and non-conformities promotes quality and efficiency. And that's all. Thank you very much um, for the presentation, um, the detailed presentation. I think you said there was 
penalties for non-compliance? Yes. Can you explain maybe what the they were? Chemicals to the hospitals. If uh, we have uh, a set of rules, those rules are about uh, complying with uh, maximal uh, time for surgery, but they are also uh, rules according to equity. If you pass a, uh, a patient in front of another one, that's a non-conformity. Uh, and if you don't uh, inscribe, if you don't make your resistors well, that's a non-conformity. And all that have a penalty that is uh, contractually with the hospitals established. So the hospital will have less money if the, he has uh, lots of penalties, lots of non-conformities. Um, uh, uh, just be interested that some of the information that we're gathering has been around the whole patient journey. And I think you referred the we no. need to look from a person that is referred for treatment right through their entire journey. Would that be your...? No. We have two different systems. We are trying to integrate them. Okay. That's the future. Now we have we're monitoring the time between inscription in the list. It's a central national list uh, to treatment. We have another program that uh, monitors the referral to the first consultation. And we have a gap between first <laughs> consultation and um, the inscription in the list. That gap is not monitored. It's established how much long it can be. It can be from five days in urgent cases to one month in non-urgent cases, but it's not monitored. So now we, what we are trying to do is to come together with these three times, the referral to first consultation at the hospital, the first consultation at the hospital through the inscription, to the inscription of the, in the list, and uh, the last one is what we measure now, uh, and these numbers are from the inscription to uh, treatment. So to deal with waiting times, is it better to look at the entire patient journey? The point of view of the patient, it would be better without a doubt, because what matters to the patient is he has a problem and uh, the, the time begins to count when the problem surges. So uh, it, it, if it would be possible, the ideal was to measure the time to go to the general partition and then from the partition, general partitions to the hospital and so on uh, until the problem is solved. Uh, but it's, you, you have to see if you have the means to address the problems that will disclose her with that. So uh, you, you, can, uh, you can see that you will, should have to make much more uh, investment in the, the system to cover all the process. That's why we are delaying a little bit the viewing of all the process. Because if you have uh, dark, dark points, um, the system will adapt and will um, take the, the times in the dark points. And I, know, I noted as well that you talked about, I think you talked about political will in relation to this. Is that, is that a big factor in trying to tackle <coughs> issues around waiting times? And, and Portugal, what, what, was, what was your experience? What was the biggest driver, if you like, to try to tackle issues around waiting we, we, In Portugal, we have a, a problem that the, our constitution says a problem and a, a bless, oh, okay? It's a pro, the constitution says that every person has entitled to every kind of treatments and uh, every treatment that uh, puts you well. So uh, it's difficult for the government to establish a line uh, with whatever you should provide to, uh, to people or what you can't provide. And uh, prices are, are going up. Technology in medicine is uh, every time is more sophisticated. So uh, the reality is that we can't afford to pay for all. 
but we can't also to establish the deadline. That's the, the trade that it would be necessary to uh, politically solve. Uh, CIGIC, what's doing now, it's doing the process more efficient so we can achieve to do more surgery uh, because we had a gap of productivity. We can put uh, public hospitals more productive if we, go, we establish the right incentives. But, and just finally for me, uh, one, of, one of the pieces of information that we found is that sometimes investment or money can be injected to part of the issue, but it doesn't, it doesn't address the, the overall issue and sometimes it can actually almost uh, support bad practice. Yes, I understand. I understand the question. Uh, we, in Portugal, we pay for um, for the acts, medical acts. So, uh, if uh, an hospital do more medical acts, even if they are not needed, they will get more paid. That's why we are trying to uh, to trade that to another uh, form of uh, financial funding uh, that sees the, the whole uh, episode, therapeutic episode. Uh, an example, if you have uh, to replace um, um, uh, a whip, then for the whole thing we'll, you'll get for consultation, examinations, etc., you'll get to a certain, a certain amount. Um, this will stop the uh, growing up of uh, multiple uh, appointments, eventually not needed, to increase uh, the, um, the budget. Uh, if we can, at the same time, put different systems, public and private ones, uh, competition with them, each other, uh, we, we are willing that, we are expecting that uh, with that we can maintain uh, costs at the lowest price. The problem with this is we, at the same time you uh, measure access and you measure production, you should measure also quality and results in, in health results because you can have a decrease in quality and we have seen that in several uh, aspects and several points, minor points, but that it happens. And definitely, finally, have, have you seen, as a result of tackling waiting times, better health outcomes? Or oh, we, ha we had a, a big problem in excess in Portugal. So uh, we have a uh, huge increase in the excess. Nowadays, uh, people can go to the hospitals. We had uh, waiting lists for two, three years in the past, people waiting two, three years, and in the overall, um, that is reduced dramatically. Nowadays, uh, most of people has her treatment in three months, but you, you can see six, eight months in, in the worst cases. And uh, the very uh, one thing that we have also, and we are not quite well, but much better, mm -hmm is the difference in the country. Uh, in the north, we have much better access than in the south. So uh, we are trying to, to make the country more homogeneous, more uh, like, mm. alike. And uh, is there evidence that that is improving health outcomes for, for the population? General health outcomes have not decreased. So. Uh, this program has, uh, we don't have measures uh, very precise for health outcome. We have the gross health outcome measures like uh, uh, net mortality and, and so on, and life expectancy. But with these programs, we need to have a, a program for each kind of pathology, because we must know what is better uh, with surgical plastic, uh, with uh, orthopedics, 
that are not uh, have a, a great impact in survival. So we have to make several um, studies and monitoring programs uh, to each of those um, pathology. It's not case sensitive enough to have the big picture, to see the big picture. In the big picture, we, we are a little better than in the past, uh, a little worse uh, in the last year because we have uh, an, in other, not in surgery, but in other uh, areas, uh, in account to the crisis, less access to other. That's a problem also. If you must address health and, uh, as a whole, because uh, if you focus only in surgery, you can then in the other places, accompanying uh, diabetes and so on, you can have a backfall. So um, last year we have a, a little difference in, in, in going worse, but generally we last years we are growing uh, better in results in surgery, but it's not very specific for surgery and for each pathology. That's something we have yet to do. Okay, thank you for that. Jim? Thank you. Um, what, I, what I find so extraordinary about what you're saying is that we see Portugal as undergoing an incredibly difficult economic time since 2008. And were you able to continue the progress through this economic downturn and a cut in the health budget? Yes, I'm, I'm amazed, amazed also with that. Uh, I think we, uh, public health and uh, uh, public health service has a, a, a large waste in, in, in uh, health assistance in Portugal. 80% of all health assistance is public. So. Uh, con the, the, the restrictions in budgets for hospitals uh, are essential in salaries from doctors and nurses and so on. And they are not responding uh, yet. I don't know in future what's going to happen, but they are staying there. They are not leaving, uh, but they are earning um, less uh, and much lesser than they earned uh, three, four years ago. So uh, you can have a, a medium, medium career a doctor can, in, in the hospital, a consultant in a middle career can have 40%, 40% less than he had two, three years ago uh, in salary. We had uh, very strong measures in public uh, expenditure because taxes are much higher and the salary has decreased and we had uh, the possibility to do extra time work. Extra time work were very well paid. Now it's not very well paid and so on. So uh, in and all, we are still working the same but we are earning much less. Did I pick you up right that you said that you had, that there's only 1,500 patients waiting more than three months? Is that right? That you got, got yeah, the medium? Medium of waiting uh, time. Uh, it's important to, to see how we measure the, the waiting time. It's two, ways, two possible ways to measure the waiting time. We measure the, the waiting time for the patients that are not yet operated, not yet treated, they are still in the list, okay? And we have 150,000 150, yes, uh, people in that list. But everyone else... And the medium for that people is three months, uh, 2.8 now, Does the that last number. That every other patient is, has to wait at less than three months? No. No, that's the average. You, no, you, you have, that's the medium, because you, you see, if, if you see the, the curve of the, uh, the time to uh, transfer, to, to operate people, and to, you'll see that most people is treated in one, half, one month and a half, two months, and then you have a queue in that line, and you have yet uh, lots of people that wait for six months, nine months, is, 10 months, there are certain specialities that have 
major difficulties to, uh, to overcome that, uh, uh, that time. So the me in the medium, the medium is three months. The average, it's three months. But, but you managed to bring that down by 59%. You managed to bring overall waiting times down by 59%. Yes, because the medium was eight months. Yes. The average was eight months in the past. I was very, very interested in your idea that a patient could refer themselves to a private hospital, get the work done, and then the health service, the Portuguese health service, would pay. pay. They, they don't refer themselves. Uh, automatically, we emit the central uh, office emits a voucher uh, when patient achieves 75% of maximum time guaranteed. Maximum time guaranteed in Portugal for normal situations, we have four categories. We have normals, uh, uh, normal priority, that it's nine months. So when uh, time counts to six months and 22 days, it automatically is emitted a voucher that permits uh, that in the voucher you have all hospital, private hospital that perform that kind of surgery that the people needs. And the, each, especially each person can uh, op, uh, choose to stay in his hospital and, or to go to one of those other uh, hospitals, private ones, and have surgery performed. And, and the state will pay for that automatically? The state will pay for that, yes. Uh, how, how do you keep within your budget, because presumably most people at six months and 22 days will say, well, I'll go to the private hospital. Our, our Most people don't it, achieve six months, you see. <laughs> the average yes. is three months, so most people don't have the options to, 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 to have the voucher. So does the, the, the problem in the, how does a, a queue form and the, the time, when you measure times, how do you get a higher time or a, a lower time? It has lots to do with the form how uh, people are managed in the least time. If you have a regular, a normal curve, and everybody is treating everybody in the more or less the same time, uh, you shouldn't have any person with forces because any person will achieve the six months to to have to to have the forces. The problem is you have some specialities that um, in some places, some hospitals, that have longer queues. And, and those queues and those persons will achieve six months, ten months. At six months, they, they receive the voucher. But we, one thing we have uh, in mind when contracting with privates uh, as a concern of, uh, of the budget is that the contract with private is for less than uh, the, the money expenditure in public health. So if that person goes to private for the state, it will cost less for us, for the government. Yeah, you see, uh, uh, fa fascinating, but I, I would think there would be many private clinics here who wouldn't agree to charge less than what the state pays for the operation. They just wouldn't take on the work. So you must obviously have a good relationship with the private sector. I don't. We, we have a problem of productivity in, in in the public sector. So they can they they are able to do that uh, more productively than in the public sector. So you see, if you have a, an hospital that is uh, mounted to treat. Uh, uh, very complicated situations at the same time that it's going to treat uh, simple situations that are the most uh, uh, most frequent. Then we, you have an investment that it's not rentabilized and you have all kinds of people there working, but it's not really needed for most of the things that are doing there. We, weren't able yet to achieve uh, the maximization of the productivity in uh, public hospitals. So private hospitals can be much more productive than uh, public ones. And for that, they can achieve the uh, lower prices 
uh, say, 20% lower than the cost, public costs. Public costs are also incremented uh, a little bit with some uh, contaminations, you see, because uh, even if we have a separated uh, social uh, department, not in the, the healthcare, uh, public hospitals can't, uh, the social uh, department can give the responses at time, and so uh, public hospitals will stay with patients that can't go anywhere else. We had a, a evidence from Scotland and they also had a, a central monitoring system where all the waiting lists were fed through to, to one desk. Mm -hmm. You have a similar system yes. in Portugal. Yes. Is it you that's, that sees all the statistics or who actually... Yes. Right. So you're able to identify hospitals that are performing poorly and those that are performing well. Is there in the Portuguese system a, an ability to move patients to hospitals that have capacity? Um, you have 109 hospitals, I think. Uh, yes. Can you, can you, do you, move, do you, as sort of a central control, move patients Is around? There, you, you, you cannot move patients without their agreement. So you must ask them if they want to move. That's the first problem. Then uh, the second problem is. It's just worth it to, to move patients from one hospital to the other if the other one is much more, has a much more capacity to respond in real time. Because uh, if not, you'll change the problem from one place to another one. Uh, we are trying to do that. We are trying to incentivate, we are trying to uh, make organization policies in hospitals, the public hospitals, in the sense that they um, want to, to get more, more patients. But as we cannot in this time to give the um, incentives uh, to the professionals, because now that we are in crisis, the incentives are cut off, it's forbidden to give incentives over the salary. So it's not easy at this time to incentive other hospitals, even if they are performing better, to receive uh, patients from another place. Uh, so it, there are two things. First is you must to, um, get the consent of the patient to move them to another list or to another hospital because patient has already spoke with the doctor, has agreed with that doctor in particular what kind of surgery, what are the, the, the consequences of the surgery and so on. So we don't think it's uh, uh, ethical to just take off that patient there and put it in a, at a place. It can be done, but just if he consents in this. And we say, if you go there, you'll be treated in less time. But mobility is also a problem. So um, many patients won't want to, to, to pay the extra that comes with mobility issues. If you're taking the, the patient from one place to another that the, it's far from the hospital than the actual one, that would be a, a problem for, for moving. Roy? Thank you for your presentation. I, I was interested in how you had emphasized that uh, placing a penalty has actually forced hospitals to improve their productivity. So my question is, how do you pitch the penalty at the right level to the right organisation? Because uh, each setup may limit their ability to respond, and if you pitch it too high, you will actually just completely undermine the service, and they will not be able to reply to it. So how do you pitch the level of the penalty, and how do you know whether or not there is capacity within a, a hospital to improve? We have a benchmarking on productivity. So we know which hospital, which sector in, in, in an hospital is performing badly in comparing to the other ones. Uh, that's one point. Uh, how do we apply the penalties? 
so far it has been just at the financial level for the hospital as a whole that it's not very uh, effective because uh, we have a difficult, uh, strong issue to close an hospital. So even if that hospital uh, doesn't perform financially uh, good enough, it will be sustained by the government. Uh, it will be paid off. So uh, now, uh, in contracting with uh, the top managers, uh, the contract includes its uh, penalties uh, and you can eventually not have uh, continuous as a top manager if you, um, you, if you fail the, the targets. And that's uh, another that we are now doing that. It's very recent. It's just last year and this year it's going to put on Mars, on, on place. And we are also, in this year, doing uh, um, restraints to additional practice that additional practice for doctors are seen as an, an incentive. It's not really incentive because we are paying for doing things, but uh, they are seen as in incentives. So uh, we now are uh, trying to limit the access to that practice uh, if they don't uh, achieve the minimal productive standards that we publish. So you, you just can earn the, the rest of the money for the rest of the production if you actually uh, achieve the, the, the minimal standards that are published. And the minimal standards are at the 25 top uh, of productive in old, on old countries. So uh, it's... Um, a big step you have to do to to achieve to that that kind of additional payment. Do, do you have a, a uniform um, health um, accounting system in order to be able yes. to attribute costs? Because depending where overheads are, are parked, that can have a major uh, yes. bearing. All, all episodes are called by CD9. Uh, is, and uh, they are uh, well, they are coded, and, and, and uh, in no country with ECD9. Now we are migrating to ECD10, uh, but uh, all, all episodes are coded. And, and, uh, what, what percentage increase in productivity do you think you've achieved uh, by these pressures on on the hospitals, public service? Well, we achieve. Uh, nearly 50% of productivity of the hospital, not uh, in according to the expenditure. That uh, account is not yet made. Uh, because it's, uh, the expenditure has rise also. But we know that the price per unit is uh, fallen. And we estimate over 20% less than uh, three, four years ago. Uh, in uh, measuring productivity in expenditure basis, income basis. Final question, uh, you mentioned earlier on that, that uh, um, screening and, and various tests is, is all part of an integrated uh, service. Um, I'm picking up with our service that um, it, it can, depending on where it's parked, it can be a blockage. Um, um, who decides when the test occurs? Is it the GP or is it all you have to see the consultant before you uh, get that added delay to an operation or a, a process? In theory, uh, to go to a consultant, you must to go to the GP first. In practice, in Portugal still till now, uh, we are trying to change that, but till now, 30, just 30% 30 of the cons first consultation with the consultant is uh, f coming from a GP, it's a public GP. The other ones is uh, the patient that goes to the hospital, is cross-references from other consultants, other hospitals. Uh, so um, we are trying to improve and we including uh, we are a financial uh, incentive 
that uh, references that come from GP, but it's not forbidden uh, to uh, to have a patient to consultate a patient, uh, even if he came not uh, by a GP. To what extent can GPs request uh, appropriate tests as opposed to consultants, so that there isn't a, a bottleneck at the consultant level? That's also quite different uh, all around uh, the country. Now, uh, the, the funding uh, are the funding for uh, examinations were not uh, inputted to uh, G to GPs, so they could ask whatever uh, because it wouldn't affect their their budget. Now. Uh, we have two kinds of systems uh, for GPs. We are changing. That change is uh, slow. We have 30% in the new form. This new form permits that GPs have incentives to their practice uh, in function of quality for services, the number of attendants, etc. But uh, the examinations and uh, are. Uh, are, are being observing that funding also, so those GPs don't want to uh, to ask for much examinations, and they refer earlier to the consultant in hospital, because if the the examination is asked for by the consultant, it's the hospital that that pays, not the the funding for the GP. Then we have a mixed uh, situation now. Thank you. Thank you. And Farewell. Thank you, Chair. Uh, can I just touch on the on the IT system? And clearly, that's key to the the whole project. And and uh, how difficult or easy or however was it to implement that or commission that IT system? For us, uh, we have a good start because 80% of the hospitals have the the same uh, information system. So we could um, change one system and it changed 80% of the, uh, the, 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 the whole systems. Uh, and then we said to the other hospitals that have private, that system was a public one, was uh, from the government. Then we said to the other ones that they should alter their uh, systems in match that they comply with the, 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 the central one. So it wasn't very difficult. Uh, now we have experiences, uh, serious difference, in trying to match different systems. In, uh, when we are trying to match the primary care system with the hospital system, that's being a problem. Uh, but the first, the first one wasn't. Uh, I think uh, if you have a strong determination and you say uh, things must go there and the requests for functions are those. And by in three months, if you don't comply with those requests, you won't uh, process things, things will change uh, quick enough. Was, was there a, a big cost implication in terms of the IT system? Uh, we have an estimation of the all uh, modification of ITs and, and manutention, uh, eerie manutention of, um, how do you say, one and a half million per year for five years. It's not, not an extraordinary cost. Yeah. That's what, uh, for all countries to connect all hospitals and to have a central system to uh, analyze data. And, and report and, and make the reports and also all that. Just to be clear then, the, the system has got to be available in common to all hospitals. Yes. And all hospitals must have an electronic record of the patient. Not a, a complete electronic record, but uh, the consultations uh, must uh, be electronic, yes. Also, uh, medical uh, text must it's not uh, it's compliant. Not simply and, a record. And the system has two things. Uh, the system has two ways of work. One way is to interact with local systems, uh, and uh, data passes by 
the local system to the central system. For hospitals that don't have a, a local system that is good enough to, to connect, that has all the requirements, they can connect directly in the central system and they uh, put their information there. That's what's happened with most private sec uh, systems, private uh, hospitals that have uh, less uh, quantity and then they don't want to acquire another system, so they use the central system as their own um, electronic process manager system, if you know, if you like. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, can I thank you for that information and for taking the time to come here? Obviously, this is something that the committee taken very seriously um, and your evidence today will, will feed into that. I think probably is important in terms of the central unit that's in existence uh, and we've heard that before as some members have pointed out. So I want to thank you for your information. We'll reflect on it and it will obviously form part of our recommendations going forward. So thank you very much and safe journey home again. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, members, um, I want to just, in terms of process, advise members now that after Easter we'll reflect on all of the evidence that we've received from all of the expert witnesses and we'll then hold an evidence session with the department um, to ascertain their views on various approaches that could be taken and then we'll decide on our recommendations. Uh, that's just for, for people's information. Item five, members, is the review of transforming your care and older people. Is the evidence session with the Commissioner for Older People. I want to refer members first of all to the responses from the Minister at pages 19 and 26 uh, and the response from the South Eastern Trust at page 27. I'm going to ask the clerk at this point to brief the committee on the responses. Okay, um, thank you, Chair. The responses, um, the response um, that is on page 26, item 5.2 in the pack, um, <coughs> the department, uh, the committee had gone back to the department to ask it to clarify what it meant by supported living, um, given that the trust seemed to have um, a different definition than the department when they came before the committee. Um, and the department is defining supported living to include basic sheltered housing where tenants might not receive any support from the health service, as well as the facilities funded under the supporting people budget where people have high needs and the trusts provide a lot of support. So in the department's view, it includes all these different elements and in total they are saying there are 414 supported living facilities. Um, the other response from the department on page 20 um, provides uh, a list of uh, responses to various questions which the committee asked um, on page 20, question 1, which was about the, the supporting people budget. Um, members will note that the projected spend for 14-15 and 15-16 isn't um, significantly higher than, than this current year. Um, question 2. There are vacancies across sheltered and supported living schemes. Currently, there, there are 236 vacancies. Um, but again, that, it's not clear how many of those are in what would be called sheltered housing and how many are in the higher end supported living facilities. Um, question three. Um, the uh, department, uh, and this is the Department actually of Social Development, provided these responses on, on these questions. They don't measure the rate of turnover, just the number of current vacancies. Um, that doesn't seem to be particularly forward thinking in terms of planning for future capacity requirements. Um, if you don't know uh, uh, um, how long on average people remain in uh, sheltered or, or supported housing. Um, question four, in December 2013, there were nearly 6,000 older people on the housing waiting list, um, which would suggest that the demand is out there, but that the system can't meet the demand. Um, question, uh, question six, there are the details of proposals for the new supported living facilities at the, at the high end of needs. Um, and just to point out that for, for some of them, the estimated completion date is unknown. Um, question eight, the spend by the trusts. 
Um, just to note, the Western Trust records spends different spend differently from the other trusts and hasn't provided projections for 1415 yet and beyond. And the Northern Trust hasn't uh, replied yet to the committee's request for for this information via the department. Um, question nine. The department has, indi has included an indicator <coughs> of performance uh, in this year's um, indicator of performance direction, but there is no uh, target associated with it. So the, the actual the indicator is number of older people living in supported living facilities, and they say they'll develop a target for that next year. In terms of a definition, they're using a very wide definition of supported living in relation to that indicator and it can apply to people living in their own homes, in hostels, in sheltered accommodation and in other specialised housing. So just to make the point, it's a very a very wide definition. Okay, thank you, Catherine, for that. Um, I mean just looking at the information, it's it's clear that even it's clear that the definition isn't clear. Um, it's unclear that the, it seems to have shifted from the original uh, definition of supported living being almost a high end. Uh, supported living, and now we're being told that this includes um, things like sheltered housing, which seems to be very different from what we were originally looking at. And it also just strikes me that we're talking then in terms of, of uh, the number of facilities and the department's response talked about total facilities 414 and then we hear that there's vacancies across sheltered uh, and supported living schemes and there's currently 236 vacancies um, so it, it's there, there, I think there's a number of questions that this poses for as we proceed um, you know if we don't have a clear definition of what supported living is to start it's, it's very difficult to come up with recommendations on it Roy from discussions I've had with, with uh, the housing executive, uh, sheltered housing is when there's no health input, supported living is when there's a health input. So there's a clear understanding from other professionals involved in, uh, uh, in, in housing. So I, I don't know why confusing, confusion is being introduced by the department unless are they trying to um, widen the discussion and, and perhaps uh, create confusion. Well, can I suggest that we go back to the department on that issue for clarification? Because when when the trusts came before the committee, um, they talked about the high level facilities, which were defined as supported living, and then the department's response now is talking about the um, including sheltered housing. So, can we go back and get a clear definition? Of, from the department's point of view of what is supported living. And perhaps a definition from those responsible for housing, the housing executive as well, just, just to say that there is a clear understanding with all professionals. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, members, we are moving on to the evidence session now. Um, I want to just uh, n note to members as well that we had um, talked about visiting two supported living facilities. Uh, I suggest now that given this conversation we've just had, that the department is defining the supported living to cover sheltered accommodation. I suggest, first of all, we wait on the response from the department on their definition, but we maybe have to tweak um, our visits a bit and suggest that we, we, we may visit one example of sheltered accommodation, and then we may need to look at one example of supported living. But I think we can reflect on that once we get the response from the department. Um, the briefing paper for the um, Older Purpose <laughs> Commissioner is at page 30. So. Claire, Claire Keaton, you're very welcome. I understand this is your first time before the, the committee. Indeed. So uh, 
we'll, we'll make it easy as possible for you. <laughs> so you're very welcome. We're delighted to have the, this, this engagement with you. So the normal procedure here, Claire, is a 10-minute presentation from yourself, and we just open it up to uh, the members' questions and answers then. Okay. Well, thanks very much indeed for the invitation to meet with the committee uh, here today. Those of you I've had the pleasure of meeting with before or working with before, and very nice to see you again. And those I haven't, um, I look forward to a long and useful and productive uh, working relationship. And I said the same to you as to everybody else. My doors are open for formal, informal conversations, questions, uh, advice to the committee, and I'm always very pleased to provide whatever assistance I can in relation to uh, our services and support best meeting the needs of older people. Um, so I'm very pleased to assist the committee today in your consideration of supported living options for older people within the context of transforming your care. Um, as you know, I'm the Commissioner for Older People for Northern Ireland, which is set up as an independent public body established under the Commissioner for Older People Act for Northern Ireland 2011. And I have a wide range of statutory duties and functions um, which are, are available to you, but essentially I have a statutory duty to promote and safeguard the interests of older people, which is defined uh, as those people aged over 60, except in exceptional circumstances where I can engage uh, in relation to people aged over 50. Uh, my statutory duties and powers are underpinned by the United Nations principles as well for older people in 1991, and they include those definitions of words like independence, participation, care, self-fulfillment and dignity, and they underpin my functions. Uh, if I could, I'd like to start by briefly summarising my views on the supported living options for older people as described in your terms of reference um, for this evidence session. Now, I've followed the debate on supported housing and the need for it, uh, as well as that much wider health and social care uh, reform question through the work of this committee as well as more widely as you will imagine. Health, housing, social care are of the most enormous importance to older people, um, both in terms of their having confidence in what they need for the future and a certainty that if they're frail or they're dependent, the services are available now. Today's older people depend on the fact that somebody has already done the planning and the thinking so that the services are there. Tomorrow's older people depend on future planning and their needs being uh, taken into account within the changing demographic. Now, I'm very, very conscious that the absence of a clear and agreed definition of supported living has led to confusion uh, amongst uh, members at the hearings of this committee, because you have received what is, quite frankly, conflicting information about supported living projects and the exact number of those supported living projects that exist now and which will be financed now and in the future. That must be enormously frustrating. And what I want to say to you every time, if you're confused with something like that, take it back to, do you know what the modeling is for the future projections for older people? Then whether it's supported living, nursing care, domiciliary care, residential care, whether it's sheltered housing, supported living, assistive technology, those will fall out of the modeling of demand and need much, much more clearly. The exact detail of whether it's supported housing or sheltered housing, in some regards, I think, is less significant than whether you are confident that you have the modelling in place, which lets you know what does our population look like now and going forward? What does it want? What does it need based on what we know now? What do other jurisdictions and other international uh, jurisdictions tell us is the likely pattern of demand? What is likely to happen with things like older people being prepared, willing and able <coughs> excuse me, to sell homes with nearly 70% of older people in owner occupation? What, do, what is it we know about today's and tomorrow's older people? And then is the modelling that you see useful to you in terms of uh, engaging on whether it's good enough or whether it's not? Uh, I absolutely um, support the provision of more choice for older people about where they can live because the needs of today's and tomorrow's older people, they have to be the defining feature that drives service de uh, design and planning. And it is imperative that that is based on accurate projections of the need and the likely preferences and the likely choice uh, of today's and tomorrow's older people. And I think those should be transparent and they should be publicly available. In terms of giving great confidence to the public, let the public know what the modelling is. Tell the public, this is the trend we're seeing in ageing. This is what people say they want. This is what they need. This is the different costing options. This is what the, uh, the, the regional geography looks like. This is how many places we think we'll need. And that planning, not only transparent and publicly available, but has to include staffing, resourcing, physical buildings, as well as that more qualitative evidence. Because the, if the focus is on the evidence of need, as I said, the planning is much more likely to fall out 
of it and your opportunity uh, for scrutiny and accountability much more straightforward. But of course, it's also imperative that the additional modelling, uh, sorry, the modelling of the additional service and support needs for older people who live in this supported housing is provided. And I hear a lot of anxiety from people, uh, uh, to really for, from older people who currently receive care, as well as people who are likely to need care in the next 10 years or so, about whether or not the services and support will be available to them. And they want to be assured that the modelling for supported living, for example, um, also includes all those additional services and support needs. So things like um, nursing care at home, domiciliary care, uh, physiotherapy at home, uh, community meals, befriending, social activities, advocacy support, things like palliative care, aids and adaptations. And those all have to be in place if the supported living arrangements are going to be effective. Uh, I know you were interested in looking at the extent of involvement of older people in planning uh, and design of services, and certainly any planning and modelling has to involve older people, but not just today's older people. It has to involve looking at what some younger people think they're going to want in the future, and it also has to look at evidence within this jurisdiction <coughs> and internationally about what trends look like and, frankly, what didn't work as well as what did. What seemed like a really good idea at the time but hasn't worked so well, and then look quite critically at why that might be. Because we want the very best here in Northern Ireland. We have some absolutely excellent health and social care facilities here, without question, and recently I've been in a number. And they are some absolutely excellent facilities, without question. We also have some that aren't, and we have some very significant pressure points of demand, and we have considerable anxiety amongst the public about future planning. I would come back again to the question of care assessment for individuals, because this, remember, is about each individual older person. And care assessment is critical. And the person, the, the care manager, assessing the needs of the individual older person must be able to offer a range of options. If he or she is to be able to provide that older person's uh, assessed needs with choice, that, that care manager has to have choice available to them to offer. Um, and older people then must be able to choose from the most suitable to meet their assessed needs. And care assessment, uh, while there's a need for publicity for uh, supported living and publicity for a range of options, care assessments mustn't be a vehicle to simply promote one style of choice, one style of living. And I would say, I suppose, as well, that supported living options and whatever their future developments are will not necessarily reduce the need for domiciliary, residential or nursing care, because the overall population rise and the overall demand in health and so, uh, social care support will be significant as our population ages. And I would just say for the record, of course, that it is very, very good news that we have more older people in our population. More of us are living longer and healthier lives than ever before, and that is very good news. But it is incumbent on all of us to make sure that the planning is done to also recognise that particularly amongst the so-called very old, those aged over 85, Jim, how are you doing? Um, those aged over 85, the planning has been done so that they, we can age confidently with certainty that in the event that we're frail, the services and support will be available to us. And to date, I have not seen a comprehensive plan that outlines the, uh, outlines the need and future demand for supported living, uh, particularly on a variety of models, for a number of years ahead. Much of the planning does still seem to be quite short-term planning within current short-term envelopes of money, and I think that's something that this committee could usefully address. And you asked me to look at the three elements of your terms of reference, which are really the structure and availability of supported living, the capacity of supported living to meet the objective of transforming your care in terms of reducing the need for residential homes, uh, places, and to identify examples of best practice. And I'm quite happy to outline that if you want me to. I'm not sure where I am in the 10 minutes because I don't have a clock here. Um, so, uh, um, or I can deal with any questions, Chair, at your oh, preference. Whatever. I mean, you have a few minutes there if you want to. In terms of the structure and availability, availability the simple, sorry Mr Gard, um, the availability uh, is almost impossible to answer because there is a, no agreed definition. And I would say go, go back and ask for clear modelling. I'm sure, as confident as I can be, that the information will be available in a variety of places. And I think the modelling needs to be put together so that um, the, the, the definitions are clear, the level of need is clear, and you can see where the match is or isn't. Um, because otherwise I, I can't really assist you with the availability and structure of supported living options on an unclear definition. I have been to some very excellent sheltered housing, and I've been to a very excellent supported, what's described as a supported living facility, but I can't give you much more information uh, than that. 
Um, many of the figures about supported living are not available, and I have not been ascertained, uh, able to ascertain with any certainty exactly what the level of supported living facilities is, nor what the definition is, nor what the future planning is. Uh, and I think that would be very useful. Uh, I would also ask um, the committee to consider that need for allied support uh, in that modelling and planning. So if people are living in supported living, they may well need other care and support facilities and services. You asked, also asked about the assessment of the capacity of supported living to meet that policy objective in transforming your care in terms of reducing the need for residential home places. And I suppose what I would say is it won't do away However many supported living places there are won't do away, won't, re won't remove the need for domiciliary nursing or residential care. But supported living does have the potential to meet the needs of older people, some of them. They can be absolutely excellent at creating a space for people to live independently, confidently, free from fear with the support they need um, in an individual accommodation with communal facilities. And it can transform people's lives and rejuvenate their independence. But of course also there must be a mix of living accommodations available and supported living will not be appropriate to meet everybody's needs. And I would say that the lack of forward planning information that's available has made it much more difficult to assess the capacity of current and planned supported living options. And that uh, future need is, is just so clear for planning and modelling that's accessible, transparent and based on the evidence of projected current and future needs. There are models that have been developed uh, as a basis for assessing future need for supported housing, and there's a number of them. The National Housing Federation, Housing Corporation, the Mayor of London's Office and the London Supported Housing Forum have published a very comprehensive toolkit which uses key concepts that feed into a predictive model of need. That is only one example. There are a number of them, uh, and I would urge the committee to consider uh, whether you would like modelling against any of those. But they include the obvious things you would expect, like what's the population in need, what's the population at risk, um, what's the duration of service need likely to be, the cost uh, and other demand adjustments. And determining need and demand can be difficult because, of course, many people only consider supported living at the point when the need arises because we don't want to think that we will need that in the future. Um, but it can be partially alleviated by careful modelling which looks at reasonable best estimates and best projections based on useful uh, models. And I think finance and projected future costs obviously play a part in the thinking behind transforming your care between with, you know, the overall management of health and social care, and rightly so. And I recognise the challenging budgetary circumstances in which the executive operates. But what I would urge you with every ounce that I've got available to me is to say that the very best value for the public purse is delivered when older people receive excellence and choice and dignity and fair treatment. And the more clearly that is modelled and planned, the more likely it is that we will have the workforce, the facilities, the services and the confidence amongst older people that they need. Uh, there are some small differences between the different additions of transforming your care as well that cause some confusion over the nature of the objectives related to supported living. Uh, the initial publication set out uh, an aim for people to be supported to live independently at home or in supported accommodation. Uh, and the implementation document talks about people living at home or in assisted housing. So the confusion around what exactly the definition are, uh, definitions are really does go back as far as that. Uh, in relation to examples of best practice in relation to supported living, I know that from the research assembly research papers you've had, you have seen a number of different uh, options which could be regarded as best practice, both within this ju uh, jurisdiction and outside. There are some excellent examples, and I think what you'll also find as well, if you look carefully across different jurisdictions, you'll find some that aren't so good. They are not a panacea. They are a very useful option. They can be absolutely exemplary, and they need to be planned, and they need to be managed and delivered to properly regulated standards. Um, that's really all I wanted to say to you by way of introduction. I'm very happy to have any conversation you like on, on this topic. Okay, thank you, Claire, for that. A very frank, useful advice, as always. Uh, just, and I suppose we were having the conversation just prior to your evidence around the definition and th that's a very clear point coming out in the information that you've provided us with today. It is, it is impossible to work on recommendations in the absence of that definition but you, you've also taken it further and outlined the issue about the modelling um, and you know, we have raised this continuously that we know 
the statistics we know the forecast in terms of the aging population in fact at last week's stakeholder engagement session we were actually given the statistics per constituency and we know the differences even uh, across constituencies and trust areas um, so therefore that that information is there um, and it just strikes stri certainly strikes me that there is there has been a lack of that forecast or planning that's taken place at any strategic level is is that your experience as well is that what you're saying that there isn't the planning in place i know you mentioned you hadn't seen the comprehensive plan so is that your sense of it what i would say chair is that i haven't been able to access a comprehensive plan uh, of a comprehensive modeling of future, future need, future demand, and service delivery against it, including workforce planning, allied services, and buildings. And certainly we'll see in the proposals for closures um, or consideration of closures of statutory residential care homes that one of the criteria now in the revised uh, documentation and consultation <coughs> is to look at what the alternative provision is. Because in consideration of whether this particular statutory residential home should be retained or not, has to be considered alongside what the alternative options are. Um, and that is somewhere where there may well be uh, a swift need for uh, comprehensive modelling because no proposal should be coming forward without that clear evidence and information. But I, I can't think of anything that would give older people and their families more confidence than knowing that the planning is robust and comprehensive. And I suppose, because you, you mentioned the current consultation and, and where the committee are coming from is the transforming your care is obviously very focused and shift into community primary care, uh, older people being cared for at home, reablement processes. So that you know that's why we're exploring the whole notion about well, what are the alternatives? But how do you involve older people in that process? And I suppose there's there's wider issues there and and. We've seen it particularly very starkly around the residential homes issue, where there just didn't seem to be any sense of protection of rights for our elderly population. And I, I know that's bigger, obviously, than just the supported living issue, but I think it's very, it's very important for our society to have that message, but to look at how do you do that you know have there been other examples where that's been done you know rights models bills of rights um it just seemed to be that the elderly population at that stage were almost swept to the one side and there wasn't really any support or safeguarding of their rights in relation to that the question involving older people is very very central to any any planning to do with um need any planning to do with where people are going to be living and how they're going to be cared for. And certainly in relation to the statutory residential care homes issue, the most important people to consider are the people who currently live in those homes now. Whatever else goes on with planning, whatever else goes on, those people, that is their home, and they need to have the, uh, the first consideration in terms of being engaged. But in terms of future planning, there's every point in involving today's older people in what they think they would like provided they have enough information to look at what the, all the options are and, and really are included in a meaningful kind of a way. But we also need to ask tomorrow's older people what they think they're going to be wanting. Uh, and we also need to look internationally to see what the evidence is about when you have a trend towards different types of housing or different sorts of health and social care provision, how it actually works. So it really is not just about <coughs> asking older, today's older people what they want. Um, it is about looking at the range of options, seeing which people would prefer the most, uh, and also looking at what we think we want for the future and what works and doesn't work internationally. But I think dignity and respect are absolutely central. Every single person I have ever spoken to about care for older people says, I want to be sure that in the event that I am frail or I develop dementia or I am um, socially isolated or in some way I need care and support, that it will be available to me at that point based on my assessed need and it will be available at a standard and a level and without question that is one that meets my needs. Now, 
everybody. I mean, I don't, I'm sure you're all in the same position. You've heard it in your own families. You've probably got it in your heads at the moment, and you'll have heard it from constituents. It is that certainty that people are looking for. And I think that involvement of older people is central, but as also is, look as widely as we possibly can and say what works, what doesn't work, and let's put in the best for Northern Ireland. But what about the, the issue about rights, you know, a rights framework for the elderly community? In what context, Chair? Just safeguarding the elderly population. I'm just wondering, has there been, are there examples elsewhere of where the elderly population, the rights of the elderly community, will be more protected or safeguarded? There are, there are international frameworks, United Nations principles. There are different jurisdictions which have different sorts of legislation which set out to protect uh, older people from harm or in terms of access to services, in terms of rights. There are a variety of international um, scenarios and, and legal protections. And what I would say, I suppose, is that whatever they're like, whatever those protections are like, older people don't want to have to litigate to get what they need. They want the people who are paid to plan, provide and deliver services to deliver them properly in the first place. And I get much, much more pressure from older people to, to influence that end of planning, if you like, rather than enforcement. Because what I hear again and again is very, very old people saying, I haven't got the time to go to law. I haven't got the time. I was with, uh, in a nursing home yesterday um, and talking to a number of people in their 90s who've got relatives in that nursing home who've had uh, severe strokes and on a number of, uh, of issues. And somebody had, had had a difficulty moving from one hospital facility to a care home and then onto this other care home and my office had intervened. And what they said was the only other advice they got from anybody was to go and see a solicitor. And the solicitor just said, this will take years. And he said, I haven't got years. My wife hasn't got years. She's had a major stroke. People want those services now. And I think the planning needs to focus on that. Okay. Sam has indicated Thanks, uh, Commissioner. You're very welcome. It's nice to see you, but I'll not be referring to old people. Uh, could the Commissioner tell us if she is satisfied with the consultation of senior citizens over the change in transforming your care will mean for them? And how did the health department engage with them? And did they engage actually with the senior citizen or with their providers or their providers? Um, take it from the, if I take it from the statutory residential care closure end and, and work that back, okay. um, certainly the involvement of older people who reside in statutory... Senior statute citizens. <laughs> they are senior citizens. Uh, and your definition of a senior citizen? Well, it's your definition of old people. Over 60s, those aged over 60. Whatever you want to apply, okay. but they're um, senior citizens. So I'm just, I'm just trying to make sure that I'm clear, because we've already had issues with definitions, and so I'm just <laughs> trying to be absolutely clear. We're talking about people aged over 60. And, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, in relation to statutory residential care homes, I think there was inadequate engagement with people who live in those uh, residential homes, or certainly uh, in a number of them. Uh, at the point the initial consultation went out. I think the process that has been engaged in with the Health and Social Care Board has made very considerable efforts to engage meaningfully with people who live in those statutory residential care homes and with their uh, relatives uh, and indeed with staff. I think there's been considerable efforts there. Um, I think in terms of consideration of um, the whole issues that are involved in health and social care and transforming your care. There is a wide evidence base about what matters to older people. It's not just about going out and asking older people in the here and now. There is a wide evidence base about what matters to older people, and there has been some engagement with older people. There can always be more, but every single piece of engagement, again, that I've seen, says that older people say that they want certainty and they want confidence. They want confidence that the planning's been done and certainty that the quality of service will be right. So I think that's probably the, the best answer I can give you, is that the, any engagement with older people will say that loud and clear. I hope you adopt the attitude that they're not old people, they're senior citizens, as far as I'm concerned. I treat don't have them. any definition with, with your use Treat them with respect. We're not talking about old dogs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr Gardner, I'm sorry, uh, Chair, I'm sorry. I, I'm I talking about human beings. I trust that nobody is making a suggestion that I am referring to older people in that context. Absolutely. I refer to them as senior citizens, it'll be much suitable. Thank you. Okay. We're talking about here as a title as well, too. 
which is the formal title, which is the Older Parents Commissioner, which is the formal title. Thank you, Chair. I am yeah. Commissioner for Older People yeah. for Northern Ireland, and my statutory duties refer to those people aged over 60. There are a variety of phrases which people use for older people. Some, don't, some like ones and some like others, but that is the definition I use because of the statutory functions uh, you, and legislation you. to which I work. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, Fergal? Thanks, Chair. Could I return to the the rights issue because you know it's one thing to turn up to um, for a service or whatever and ask please be will you respect me or my ambition for whatever but it's another thing to say I have the right or my family has the right on my behalf to ask for a service and would a rights-based platform make a difference in terms of forcing or encouraging the department to define issues around the provision of services for older people to them the computer upstairs. I think it's a very, I think honestly it's a very, very hard question to answer because at this point what we have is a system in which people have the right, a statutory right to have their care needs assessed and I think the statutory right just needs to remain that they have their right to have their assessed care needs fully met and I think enforcement of what we already have in a lot of areas involving um, care of older people, uh, health and social care. Really we're looking at quality of service, accessibility of services and choice. Whether or not additional rights built in um, would make a difference or not, a positive difference, I think is open to considerable debate. I don't want to get into the personalities but I'm aware of one case where uh, an elderly lady with dementia uh, had lived in a specific facility for a long time and that facility could no longer deal with her but they evicted her to all intents and purposes <coughs> she then went on to in an agitated state fall and break her leg she got a hospital acquired uh, infection spent six months in hospital and died recently um, and wouldn't rights have made a difference in that case um, without looking at a particular individual case detail, what I would say is it is easy to forget that different facilities provide care and support for people at particular stages of their lives or with particular yes, needs. The system looked after itself there and the patient got forgotten. Well, and that's inexcusable. And I do get a number so, of... So, back to my point. What will copper fasten the proper treatment for that individual if it isn't right? What will copper fasten proper treatment is proper planning proper accountability, proper regulation, proper inspection in the first instance. Make sure that what we deliver is properly delivered. But we don't have that, is what you're saying. I'm saying there are a number of flaws for, for absolute certain. I mean, we have an, a number of complaints and issues coming through my office in which older people describe situations similar to the ones you have described. Uh, and certainly where people have not felt that they've been treated with dignity and respect, where they have felt that they have been subject to ageist attitudes uh, and been denied treatment or treated differently uh, because, <coughs> of their, uh, because of their age. And certainly when people don't feel that they've had a wide range of choice um, and I think the question of, as a, for us as a society is in planning. What is it we want our health and social care services to look like for older people? Yes, but I'm asking you, what will provoke the system to ask that question unless it's the need of the patient? If the need of the patient is ignored in favour of the system, then the system's not working. That's absolutely right. So what will provoke the system to react to the patient need? And I think that is part of the, the, the role of this committee, for certain, is to challenge and hold to account really the work of health and social care. But I think the question of whether legislative underpinning of additional rights for older people would be the thing that copper fastens is something that warrants further discussion, further debate, and I'm happy to do that with the committee. Um, but I don't think it guarantees anything. I think modelling planning, accountability, regulation, inspection, and comprehensive swift resolution of complaints when they go wrong is within the power of the uh, executive to deliver. And, and without being too broad about it, how far away from are we from that ambition? There are a large number of older people who are very satisfied with the health and social care services they get. There is some absolutely exemplary health and social care treatment in Northern Ireland, for certain. Um, there are a considerable number, I would say, considerable proportion of, of the public who are not confident that if they need health and social care in the future, that it will be there in the way that they are 
in the way that they would like to have it. There is a lack of confidence, I think. There is quite a considerable degree of fear about advanced older age and about frailty and about dementia. And that degree of certainty isn't always there. I think there are particular pressure points, which are quite clear. We've seen them recently in terms of accident and emergency services, in terms of pressures on the services, uh, certainly in terms of uh, dementia care in particular, very significant uh, pressures, both for people who are cared for in the community as well as in hospital and in other residential facilities. But those need to be planned for and to, to then be absolutely confident as a society that we talk about what works and we deal swiftly and decisively, honestly and transparently when things go wrong. Okay, Chair, thank you. Okay, thank you. For that, Kieran. Uh, thanks, Chair. And uh, Claire, delighted to see you here. I just recall that whenever this place was set up, I co-chaired um, a group called Age Sector Platform, and one of our um, requests was an appointment of a senior citizens um, commissioner. And here you are, so I'm delighted that you're here uh, talking to us, and you've given us a, a, an excellent address, I've got to say. And long may you continue. I'm sure that the, our senior citizens will continue to avail of your expertise uh, in the months and years ahead. My question is simply, um, what, 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 what would you have that would better signpost our senior citizens to the services that are um, out there when they need it? If you understand what I'm saying, Chair. I do. I think if you, if you imagine, uh, at the point when somebody needs health and social care support, particularly when they need social care support, that is brokered through our social services system, through care management. Most people, most older people certainly, have never had a social worker. They don't know what they can expect. They don't, know what, they don't know what their rights, their entitlements, a reasonable expectation, what the range of services should look like. They're not experienced at it. Why would they be? Why would most people have any idea, really, what the services and support are until the point at which they need them? And I think at that very point, care managers need to be absolutely supported to assess the needs of the individual and then to be confident themselves that there are a range of options available to them which they can then put to the older person and the older person can make the best choice with the care manager about what is going to best suit them. And I think that is absolutely fundamental in terms of promoting uh, choice and promoting options because nobody who doesn't need a nursing home now is really going to be choosing one for the future. People generally um, need to make that choice at the point of need. I think in terms of promoting more widely choice for older people, there is considerable mileage in, in having much more open conversations about the future. If you listen to younger people, and you've maybe got somebody, uh, they're single, they're in shared housing, they're a student, they maybe get a house of their own, they maybe set up a home with somebody else, they maybe have a family, they talk about changes in their living accommodations, they need a bigger house because they've got more children, they need to move somewhere because it's cheaper, because one of them's gone on to part-time work. People make all sorts of choices. When it comes to older people, what we talk about is older people wanting to stay in their own homes, as though that is a fixed um, state of affairs. Uh, again, uh, when I listen to older people, what they generally say to me is, I want to stay somewhere that means something to me, with people that I know, that I trust, that care about me. I want to live maybe in the same locality, with the things, the people uh, that are important to me. It may be in the same home, it may be in the same locality, but it needs to tick in a way that is important to me. And I think publicising choice, confidently talking uh, with older people about what matters to them, what's important going forward, is, is a big challenge. We don't do it enough. And I think a lot of older people um, continue to live in their homes because they want to and because of a lack of knowledge about the realistic choices that are available to them. Thanks. Um, I mean, uh, isolation must play a part, a major part in um, senior citizens whenever they come to a, a point where they, they, need, they do need help. But uh, the last thing they want to see is being isolated, we'll say, in a rural uh, area. They want to be feed part of, of whatever's there, supported living or, or community living or whatever. I think that's without question. I think social isolation and loneliness are a profound, profound issue for our society. 
And whether it's in a very rural area or you know, the top of a tower block, if you are frail and you are not able to get out and about and you have few visitors, you will feel imprisoned in your home and you'll feel, you will feel like the walls are closing in around you and you may very well feel isolated and pressured and afraid. And that is some of the demand for uh, supported living, some of the demand for residential care, really is because people need company. We are social animals. We need company. Thank you very much. And you keep the flag flying for our senior citizens. All of them or just one, Kieran? For, for, uh, for, for, we're all heading in that direction, <laughs> okay. so good on you. Thanks I will indeed. Thank you. Nice to see you. Uh, Roy? Again, thank you for your evidence. But just to take up uh, a point you were saying there, uh, the latter point, that you felt it's important that um, older people are... Senior, senior citizens, citizens would be able to uh, continue, continue to uh, reside close, close to family and, uh, and friends. Uh, in terms of uh, um, different options that are being provided, um, what evidence have you found that sheltered housing or supportive living is available so that they can be close to family and friends? I mean, the evidence that I've found is that, that uh, so I nearly muddled the terms up myself here, is that sheltered housing has been very popular with you know, large numbers, very, very high levels of satisfaction, very high levels of satisfaction generally with uh, on-site wardens and that degree of security. Um, some degree of anxiety when those wardens are being taken uh, away and more peripatetic, but high levels of satisfaction in terms of uh, sheltered housing for the people that it meets their needs. Um, if I'd listened to mostly to older people, they don't know what supported living is. That's the general sense I have. So it's not just a committee that's confused about the, the definitions, are largely unaware of what the choices might be for supported living. Yet when I've gone to supported living facilities uh, and met with the residents uh, of those facilities, uh, they very much welcome them, like where they're living, uh, enjoy both the independence and the freedom and the support and the care. So I think it really is the confidence, there's a lot of confidence when people live in them and they are suitable. There is a lack of knowledge about them from the outside and I think there is a uh, paucity of comprehensive modelling about what level we should have. Okay. Um, <coughs> older people who spoke to me have uh, indicated the importance that they place on being close to family and friends, whatever accommodation they, they have been um, seeking to, to live in. But in, in terms of um, uh, uh, your other evidence, you've indicated that about 70% uh, percent of older people own their own homes and that can create a barrier for, uh, in terms of potentially moving. Um, are you aware of models elsewhere which can facilitate those who may own their own home to even transfer that asset into a sheltered housing or, or supportive housing model? And there certainly are, uh, across the water in England, there certainly are a number of private sector developments um, of supported living type arrangements, sheltered accommodation. I'm, I'm loath to pick either title actually at this point because some of them fall between the two stools really. Um, but there are a number of private sector options for people to purchase into and there are a number of uh, schemes in which there is mixed tenure and mixed uh, ownership and, and rental, uh, which we don't have those sorts of schemes here in Northern Ireland in the main. However, uh, that question of the 70% home ownership, I think there is a degree of a barrier to it because people don't want to lose their homes. They don't want to lose their homes. And certainly there are cost implications for homeowners for going into um, supported living or sheltered housing or indeed residential nursing care. And it is a consideration. Would you agree that uh, if, if there is some imaginative thinking, perhaps it, it could actually help solve the financial situation in terms of providing a suitable accommodation? Because um, getting necessary finance to build such accommodation seems to be a problem for the, the, the social housing sector, but also from, the, from perhaps the, the health side of it. Is that a possibility? Um, so I'm not understanding your question. Essentially, I perceive limitations in, in, in supportive living coming partially from the limited capital budget that is available. So um, uh, are you aware of any other devolved regions who have perhaps extended the, the, the capital budget by a mixed model? 
I'm aware of mixed models. I'm not so much aware of the detail of exactly how that funding has come about in terms of the mix uh, through housing associations uh, as well as through private sector organisations. Um, but I'm not detecting any appetite from the private sector for building those kind of schemes here. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Roy. And Gordon? Thanks, Chair. Thanks very much. I think it's the first time we've met. Um, just generally, what's your understanding of how DSD and even through the housing executive, how they identify uh, demand for housing? What's your understanding within particular areas? I think that's the first time I've been completely stumped. <laughs> um, existing system, how do you understand? How do they there's identify? An, there's an exist, the obvious existing system. We have the, you know, the existing point system and the uh, assessment for housing at the point of need. We have care management, which assesses people's health and social care need. Mm -hmm. And it comes back to the question of what is the modelling within the Department of Social Development linked to um, uh, health and social care for housing which is specifically tailored towards older people. And generally, are you aware of the system and how, what triggers off? Uh, how do they identify an area for, for new build? No, I'm not a specialist in that area at all and I, I can't assist you with that. It is my understanding it's done obviously through waiting this, where they're waiting this for high demand or there is a high demand for housing. They will target those areas for for specific, you know, for new build. So just, uh, it was just a general point on how you felt. What did you feel at that? What, what do you think of that then? Uh, my instincts say think longer term. Don't yeah, wait till yeah. there's a waiting list. If somebody's an older person now, they need that housing now. They may not have 15 or 20 years to wait for budgets to come through, planning permissions to come through, planning objections to be overcome, the building to be done, the staff recruitment to be done, and the facility to be up and running. And I do think it's incumbent on planners to take that very seriously and to model in advance and plan on the basis of our population projections mm -hmm. about what it is we think is reasonable for our society rather than wait until there's a waiting list. Yeah, okay. Uh, we've had several examples of, uh, to me, what were sheltered housing, fold, hub and tag and so on. I know in my own constituency in North Down we've, we've had a number of schemes yeah. there for, for a number of years now and successful schemes. A lot of those originated have wardens in them. Those wardens have been removed. How do you see that? Do you feel that is a positive way to move forward or not? Or do you have reservations about it? And what to do in many cases is put in a call system and which is transferred through to a call centre or yeah. What's your opinion on that? Um, of course, <coughs> I mean, sheltered accommodation has got a very good reputation and is very popular. Um, generally with the people yeah. who live in it. Uh, wardens generally uh, have a very good reputation um, and provide that degree of confidence and indeed quite a number of older people will say that they've made the choice to sell up or move out of somewhere else to move because of the additional confidence that comes with having an on-site warden. Yeah. Uh, so there is a degree of anxiety inevitably that's caused when the warden service moves to something more peripatetic and uh, call services and more domiciliary care going into people's homes mm -hmm. Uh, as well and people staying there for longer. Um, I'm not aware of any I'm not aware of any how would I put it the removal of wardens and the change in the structure of the service. I'm not aware of anybody choosing to leave sheltered accommodation because of those changes. Uh, I'm aware of some concerns that have been raised yeah. about it. Uh, but sheltered accommodation does continue to be a popular option. But again, of course, safety and fear and fear of crime are very significant features for older people. And sheltered accommodation is one of the things that a lot of older people feel makes them safer and they like having a warden on site. Um, <coughs> But of course, there is then also a group of older people living together who may also perceive that to make them more vulnerable. So I think that the question of wardens, the residents like it a lot, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not aware of anybody leaving sheltered accommodation because of the removal of wardens and the change in the type of service. Finally, just what is your general opinion of the work that has been done by housing associations in the provision of such care in relation to the standard of build, the type of accommodation? I think, uh, well, this is a, a general kind of a, a, a general kind of a view. In, it's based on the popularity of those schemes with the residents. They do get very, very high satisfaction levels, and a number of them that I have visited are very, very mm -hmm. comfortable, 
um, well-maintained schemes which provide both for independence and security. Clearly there are some which are not in as, uh, that where the fabric isn't in as good a, a condition and there certainly is demand amongst a lot of older people for accommodation which is large enough for them to have relatives to stay, or to stay over or to provide care which isn't always available in the smaller sheltered accommodation uh, provisions. But generally speaking, I would say sheltered accommodation continues to get very strong ratings from older people. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Gordon. Uh, David. Thanks very much, Chair. And Claire, I think it's the first time I've had the opportunity to meet with you as well. So I, I welcome um, the going into the future working with you. Um, just, just very quickly, uh, I will make a very quick question. Um, <coughs> obviously, we have a limited scope over housing associations and so on, and, and you, you would accept that. But where we do have influence is obviously over the trusts. And in your opinion, have the trusts been doing enough to sell the concept of sheltered and supported living? Um, I, I ask that question very deliberately because there obviously was quite a lot of, 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 of concern, some of it justified, some of it perhaps a little hysterical, um, around the statutory care home issue. Um, and in my own area, North Antrim, uh, obviously we, 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 we were very vocal and, and I suppose we took a bit of a NIMBY approach, if we could if we put it that way. Um, however, I mean, the Northern Trust, obviously at the same time as putting these proposals forward, have also been doing a lot of work to build new, very attractive facilities. And I suppose one would say quite selfishly, it is the job of the Trust to try and get that point across that there is a, you know, there is a very viable and probably much better alternative um, to a number of the domiciliary homes that are there. And I do take on point that, that what you'd said earlier about there will always be a need of, of some description, and I agree with that entirely. But do, do you believe the trusts have a, I suppose maybe should, should be taking more of a leading role in working with organisations such as your own in order to, I suppose, try and make the landing a little softer than what it has been so far? I think, I think it's a very, very useful approach by both the trusts, by the board, by the assembly, by everybody connected with uh, housing, health and social care. See when we do stuff right. See when it's good. See when people are content and they feel safe, secure, treated with respect, well cared for. Talk about it. Give that confidence. Have material in the local press, have material in the media which is confidently out there and assertive about when it works. Uh, and again, I was, as I said, I was in a nursing home yesterday and a gentleman was saying to me, look, I don't, I don't want my wife to need this kind of care. She's had a massive stroke. But given that she does, I can't imagine she could be cared for any better anywhere else. Now, that degree of confidence is what we need to see. And whether that's the trust um, uh, or more widely through the health and social care sector, I think it would be very useful to talk positively about the services and support that are available to let and support older people lead dignified, fulfilled and as independent lives as possible, without question. I think the other place where uh, these kind of options should be promoted is at the, po uh, the point of care management and that care managers are very aware and should be very aware of all of the options that are available to people and what they're like and have time in their workload to go with the older person to have a look at different facilities so they can exercise meaningful choice and so you're promoting it to the individual based on their assessed care needs as well as talking more widely and then the last bit is see when things go wrong things when aren't when they're not right or when there have been problems is that we need to deal with it as a society more quickly more decisively more effectively and more transparently to recreate that confidence but yes, talk, talk about it, especially when it's good. Create that confidence. Okay. Thank you, David. Yes. Okay, Claire, thank you very much for that. I've been very frank and honest, and I think probably the big message is around the modelling and, and the need for planning and the definition, and we certainly will look forward to exploring that with you uh, as the situation moves on. I do think there are issues about um, particular issues around for example, inspections, the role of RQAA, I think also the increasing levels of dementia and the, the planning that is required for specific large sections of our population. Um, 
who will suffer from that illness. So that has to be part of the uh, the workforce planning and the department's planning moving forward. But I want to thank you for that today. You've been very frank and honest, and we look forward to continuing the the conversation with you. Thank you very thank much. You. Yeah, as, uh, as always, a pleasure to meet and engage with our elected representatives. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, sure, sure. The subject there, um, <coughs> issues made about, about planning and the importance of trust planning was mentioned uh, um, uh, by David McLean. My experience of a, a supportive living new accommodation that's being developed is that there is two sets of planning going on. There is planning within the trust, but there also has to be planning within um, um, the housing executive because they have the capital build projects. You actually need both departments doing the planning. The health department has to do a business case for the particular needs in an area, and the housing executive have to do the planning for the capital budget. So I'm just seeking assurance that we are also looking at that capital build element. Otherwise, nothing will happen. No, I think I think we do need to reflect on that, and I think. You know, I, would, I would imagine that one of the recommendations coming forward out of this process will be for that collaborative approach in relation to this, because otherwise we, it will be in silos and it won't actually address the need that's there. Okay, members, item six is a statutory rule, is the food hygiene amendment regulations. It's on page 49. Um, the purpose of it is to implement EU regulations amending the food hygiene regulations 2006. So I'm asking our members content for the right. department to proceed. Thank you. The item seven is another statutory rule, which is the Safeguarding Board for Northern Ireland Membership Procedure Functions and Committee <laughs> Amendment Regulations 2014, and it's on page 57. The purpose of this statutory rule is to place the emphasis of the Safeguarding Board's case management review function firmly on learning for the purpose of improving future safeguarding practice. Again. Are members content for the department to proceed? Okay. Item 8, members, is the forward work programme. I'm asking members to note uh, the, the work programme on page 66. The work programmes at this stage just covers up to May, um, and I'm suggesting that we don't meet the week of the European Council elections. Uh, understandable that people will have commitments. We need to get that organised. <laughs> <laughs> and forecast, maybe. Uh, our mem members are place. agreed on that. Agreed and Dan does top the poll. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I love an optimist. Uh, okay. Um, Professor Lawler from Queen's University has been in touch, um, and he's re requested that they do a presentation to the committee uh, on the European Cancer Patient Bill of Rights. Um, Queen's has obviously played a leading role in developing the Bill of Rights, so we could combine. The presentation was the visit to the cancer centre at Queen's. If members were, yes. we haven't got a date yet, but we'll come, we'll come back to people with a date. Okay. Item nine is the report on the stakeholder event um, from the second of April. There's a report on page 67. Uh, a total of 20 groups attended the event and raised issues, which are detailed in the report. Are members content to follow up on the issues as suggested in the report? And in most cases, where writing to the department or the public health agency for further information on a particular issue. Okay. Chair, Chair, I mentioned a few. There are no suggested action points, so I take it there will be no follow-up on those? Yeah, so well, m most of the groups afterwards or the, or the members afterwards mm -hmm. reflected on what the actions were. Some of the actions would have been outside of the remit mm -hmm. of this committee. Um, now, that's not to say, as constituency MLAs or individual MLAs, if there are specific actions that, that the MLAs feel need to be taken up on, that you're quite entitled to do that. But the committee as a whole felt that if there was no action that was relevant to here, then we would state that. Mm -hmm. No one there, the South Tyrone Hospital Forum. That's, that, we're, going to come, we're going to come to that. Oh, yes? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, are members okay? For First of all, with what's in the report, oh, sorry, what's in it, right? Yeah. Right. And, and I'm just reflecting as well that the the input from the staff uh, and the, mm -hmm, the, mm -hmm. the clerk of the committee and the staff uh, there was a good piece of work done, and I think it was a good engagement, and I think yeah. that people were very.
clear and focused, and it was certainly a good uh, engagement for the committee. So, in terms just of, of the South Tyrone Ho uh, Hospital Community Forum, they had suggested, Gordon, that the committee established its own advisory panel mm -hmm. uh, made up of health and social care professionals and service users. And, uh, and I can see where the group is coming from, but I think also we can inform ourselves by continuing to have those stakeholder events as, um, as a committee, and we can also continue to meet with groups as individual MLAs and continue to sponsor and attend events in the Long Gallery and continue with committee visits. So I'm suggesting that we would write back to the group along those lines. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just quite conscious that the, um, the establishment of a forum, we could have a forum for yeah. a, a quite a number of issues yeah. and, and maybe yeah. you know, be deflected or distracted from No, I tend to agree with you, okay. sorry, on that about a forum. I'm not keen on another. It was a patient and client council. We did mention that, um, Fergal, didn't we? we? did. Yeah. I think they've been there. still feel that they're somewhat limited in, in their ability to uh, put pressure and so on. And I think some people maybe in it have an interest, but we'll not go there. Well, I think we'll write back and, and, yeah. and ex express. What I would say about them, they're a very uh, committed group of people that monitored what was going on in the South Throne Hospital. And um, one thing they talked about was the out-of-hour service there. It seemed to work very well, worked very well. And there was cutbacks at the weekends, which frustrated them very much. Issues like that, they've raised it with the Trust, they've raised it with the various agencies, but no one seems to be doing much about it. Whether we can put on pressure or ask questions, because we can do that, or the MLAs in that area can do it. But, you know, uh, those are the sort of issues that came here and made a genuine sort of submission to us. And are we just going to note it and move on? That's, that's I, all I want to say. Can, can I just come in and back to the points that I made way earlier on in the, in the pre-meeting? That when it's right that there's not specific action points you know, around so somebody asked, there was a theme run through some of this stuff around preventative health and the evidence um, um, that they point to that they're that they're not being valued in a mm, financial or other right. way in terms of the work that they're doing, which after all is supposed to be consistent with DYC. So, I, I, it's in other words, it's, it's whether well, there isn't a specific action point. I think it should inform our thinking around how how we how we proceed in some of these things. Okay, so and, and, I accept uh, you mm. get the point, Gordon. You accept? Yeah, I understand. Yeah. I, well, can I suggest then that? You know, because part of this is the piece of work that we agreed to do at the start of the meeting by writing to the minister and the department about the outcome framework to TYC and the building of, of public confidence, that we reflect on that response that we get, which I think would open up a lot of, a lot of well, those particular wider issues. For example, the Cookstown people, they were able to take their heart attack rate down from being the third highest in uh, Northern Ireland to the eighth. And yet they can't get the funding now to continue that project. Mm. No, I'm not just you know the councils took an initiative. So which what's is it up? not costing the health service yeah. if they start to slide up the scale again because they're not doing yeah, this? And I think, I absolutely yeah. understand the theme, and, and I, I agree there is a particular theme running through all of these issues. So I'm suggesting <laughs> we reflect on the response back. Yeah. on terms of outcomes which will allow us to open up all of those wider discussions in my view. So members are content, Roy. Content with that, but I, I, I think at some point um, we need to consider looking at um, out of our services which, as part of TYC. So I just want to flag that issue up that's been mentioned here and I think there is a number of issues that, that follow on from that because of inadequate in some, uh, service in some areas people turn up at Accident, emergency, etc. So I just think I just want to flag that issue up for consideration at some point in the future. Yeah, no, and you're right, and we we have to reschedule um, the, the session that was supposed to take place last week. Particularly, you're right, that the GP out of hours is, is critical to all of this as well. Okay, members, we're comfortable enough that we're writing back to this particular group, but we will also reflect on the the response from the minister, which can open up a, a lot of those discussions. And obviously, as individual constituency MLAs. Quite yeah. entitled to follow up any of these Chair, issues. Just on that, Manon Now group, uh, and we were encouraging them to uh, set up a, an event here at the, the assembly. They came back, came back to our office, and they seem to be talking about a Wednesday. And I'm a bit worried about a Wednesday. Obviously, the health committee can support them, but you're not going to get support really from many other members. 
Should we steer them away from a Wednesday, or what, what's the sort of general thing? Well, I suppose it depends on who's sponsoring it, really, what, yeah. what, what advice you want to give them, but it's, it's hard sometimes to pick it's hard to beat them on here on Tuesday, really, isn't it, for those events? But it depends who you want to be there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, if it is, you, you're going to get more of a catchment from the health committee. I would suggest if it is a Wednesday, given that we're here. Um, but that's I'll, I'll leave that in your capable hands, Gordon. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. But it's just <laughs> we need all the top people there, like like the health committee. And uh, obviously, if it is arranged on a Wednesday, people will make an effort. Well, we certainly do our best. Okay. Uh, Thanks, Chair. Under matters arising, uh, I want to ask members to note. Items page ten, items ten point one, sorry, ten three, which is in pages seventy five to seventy seven. Um, page seventy nine is a response from the minister about the services for sufferers of endometriosis. Are members content to note a copy of the response to unite who had raised the matter with the committee? Agreed. Great. Yeah. Uh, are members? I'm asking members to note items 10.5 to 10.14, which is on pages 80 to 107, for noting. Mm -hmm. Under correspondence, members, um, noting items 11.1 to 11.13, which is pages 111 to 157, so they're for noting. Item on page 161 is a letter from Chambre, PA, seeking a meeting with the committee on behalf of a pharmaceutical company. Are members content to request a written brief instead? Thank you. Uh, and I'm asking members to note items on page 162 and 163. Any other business? Chair, sure. under 83, 84, page 83 there, we had that response from the Department about Connected Health, yeah. which is quite a detailed response. Is it possible to get someone from the department to come and talk to us about Connected Health, about the implications of it, and the opportunities that exist in relation to Connected Health? It's, it's an important, absolutely important issue. Um, we probably will need to just maybe pull out the specifics that we want to talk to them. I'm not in any way stopping that. I think we can write back to the department and suggest that they, um, they update us. Because I know that they do have a memorandum of understanding with the Department of Enterprise Trade yeah, and Investment yeah. with Belfast, and there are processes in play there. Is so we can certainly write back and request mm -hmm. that. The Department have set up a, a section almost in relation to working on this, and um, they have several staff engaged in it within the Department, the Health Department. So it would be useful maybe to hear from them how they are bringing forward this Connected Health initiative. Okay, I can write back and ask I think it would be useful that we, that we get them along to the committee. I don't think there's any real risks for, you, for yourself as chair or anything. You don't think you need to be that nervous about it? Oh, no, absolutely not. I mean, we're, we're actually actively working oh, good. on a Terms of Reference in the North West, which has been signed off on now. So, yes, I mean, I look forward to the update on it. There's huge a, opportunities. In. They've done quite a bit of work up there. We have. We have. And they have a centre, I believe, an innovation centre, yeah. where health is one of the issues, and mm -hmm. they're looking at You should get so much up there. <laughs> There's very little said. I knew, I knew that that was, I know, I knew that was, was what we said. Okay, back. members, date and time and place of the next meeting. Following the Easter recess, which, so it's on Wednesday the 30th of April, and it's 2 o'clock here in the Senate. Thank you. Good job. Thank you.